Hello everyone, in this video we are asked to solve a slightly more complicated trigonometric equation. In this example we are asked to solve when is sine of 3 theta equal to the square root of 3 over 2. In one of our earlier videos we discussed what the general solution to a basic sine equation is going to look like, and I've included our notes from that discussion up here in the upper right. So in general, if we're trying to solve an equation of the form sine of theta is equal to a constant a, then the infinitely many solutions can be described by these two equations. The first part of our solution set is described by this first equation. The theta values where theta is equal to sine inverse of a plus 2n pi, and the rest of our solutions are described by the second equation, the theta values where theta is equal to pi minus sine inverse of a, or pi minus our first solution, plus 2n pi, and for all this n is representing an integer, or a whole number, positive or negative. So our general method for solving a basic sine equation won't work for this equation because we have a 3 theta instead of just a theta inside of our sine function. But we can make a small adaptation or manipulation to this procedure over here to make it work. Really all we have to do to make our uh, procedure over here work for these different scenarios is make a simple substitution. So instead of trying to solve sine of theta is equal to a, we're now trying to solve sine of 3 theta is equal to a. So if we replace that theta in our original setup with 3 theta everywhere, then that'll actually work and allow us to find our solution set. So if we think back to our original setup and think of theta as the input, we can still make it work. We just have to replace our old input with our new input. So our old input was theta, our new input is now 3 theta, so if we make that substitution everywhere, it'll actually work out in exactly the same way. Our solutions will look very different, but the procedure is really just the same. So there's a few different ways to make sense of or explain this procedure. I just gave one using a kind of substitution approach. We can also describe it using transformations of functions. So let's go ahead and find our solutions using this modified approach, and then I'll also tie it back to how this can be interpreted or understood using a transformations of functions approach instead. All right, so our first solution is essentially found by taking sine inverse of each side of our equation. So taking sine inverse of the left-hand side just gives us 3 theta. That'd be equal to sine inverse of the square root of 3 over 2. And our other solution to that kind of general sine inverse process is pi minus our first solution. So that'd be pi minus sine inverse of the square root of 3 over 2. But then we can also add any multiple of the original period to get a second solution on a different period. So these are what the general solutions look like for our input. But our input is looking like 3 theta instead of just theta. All right, so we can simplify this a little bit further. One way we can simplify it is, well, square root of 3 over 2 is one of those known points on our unit circle. So that allows us to actually evaluate sine inverse of the square root of 3 over 2. And so if we think back to our unit circle, we should remember that sine inverse of the square root of 3 over 2 is equal to pi over 3. And so that means we could simplify our two equations here just by making that substitution or replacement, replace each of these sine inverses with pi over 3. So that makes our first equation become 3 theta is equal to pi over 3 plus 2n pi. And our second equation will look like 3 theta is equal to pi minus pi over 3, which gives us 2 pi over 3 plus 2n pi. And so now to finish this off and really fully simplify our solution set or our answer, all we have to do is solve for theta, which is done by dividing both sides by 3. So that makes the first equation look like theta is equal to pi over 9 plus 2n pi over 3, and dividing our second equation by 3 will turn it into 2 pi over 9 plus 2n pi over 3. And we didn't write it before, we can't forget, here n is representing some integer. All right, so we have successfully solved the equation that was given to us. We are technically done, but I said I would also describe how to kind of understand our answers from the perspective of transformations of functions. And so if we go back to that original description of our solution set and think of these almost like some other angle, like alpha or just a single theta without that multiple of three, then this really is 
the description of our entire solution set if our function was just sine of theta or sine of alpha is equal to the square root of three over two. Well, we had that graphical interpretation of our sine wave being intersected with like a horizontal line going through y equals the square root of three over two. And we can still use that graphical interpretation of the intersection of those two graphs for this new setup. But now instead of just graphing sine of alpha or sine of theta, we're graphing sine of three theta. So if we think back to our transformations of functions, sine of three theta is gonna be a horizontal compression by a factor of one third of our original sine function. So that means all these angles are gonna be divided by three or squished a little bit closer to uh, x equals zero or the origin. Right, and that's exactly what we see going on over here. Remember when we first found our angle values, they were from sine inverse of square root of three over two and those known points on the unit circle. Well, those were at pi over three and two pi over three. That's before we considered any type of transformation occurring. If we remember, we have a horizontal transformation and all these input values are being divided by three or shrunk by a factor of one third, we can understand that our pi over three gets shrunk by a factor of one third and turns into pi over nine. And similarly, our two pi over three value also gets shrunk by that factor of one third, turning it into two pi over nine. This is also reflected in this extra piece we have that describes the rest of our solution set. Remember, when I've been describing this extra piece that we add on to get to all the other periods, I've been saying we just add an integer multiple of the period of our function to get the rest of our solutions. And that's exactly what we are doing here still. But the idea now is we are working with a transformation of our sine function, not our original sine function. So we've already identified the transformation. It's a horizontal compression by a factor of one third. So instead of our original period being two pi, it's been shrunk by a factor of one third as well. And our new period is two thirds of pi or two pi over three. So we're still adding integer multiples of the period of our function to our solutions to get the rest of the solutions in our overall solution set. But we just have to adjust for that new period. So I think it's really cool that we can view it in so many different ways and tie it back to transformations of functions. But if you're not so interested in that and you just want to kind of have a algorithm or process that works every time, this is the thing to remember. Remember our general solution setup for your sine, cosine, or tangent equation. And if your input changes, make that same change to your input in your general equation. Find your solution set and then solve for that angle using that substitution or replacement that you made.